Hey, my name's Doug. I'm the senior pastor here at Live Oak. And I want to ask you, you know what word association is? Or kind of, I'm going to say a word, what comes to mind? I'm going to throw a few words out there. Um, <laughs> let's see, let's start with the word celebrity. Anything come to mind? Got a mental picture? Okay. Plumber. I don't know what you're picturing right now. I, I th- actually, I think I do. Please get that out of my head. Um, uh, shepherd. That actually made me very, quite a variety of different pictures come up. Not actually a big occupation in our day, but a very biblical term. How about the word neighbor? What comes to mind when you hear the word neighbor? I've had several interesting neighbors over the years. And the chances are, if you think about your neighbors and no one stands out as the weird or difficult neighbor, chances are you are the weird or difficult neighbor. (laughs) And so I can can think of several where I was that and several where they were that. I had one of the first neighbors, Jennifer and I had when we got married, uh, there was someone who lived next door that was very eclectic, is the polite way to say it. They were very eclectic. And uh, we had several feuds kind of going on. And one of them was kind of a difficult person to be around. And, and, and so I thought, I'm going to do something nice for them. Their, their lawn was very, I would say it looked unkept, but they would use the word, it's natural growth. And there were just plants and kind of crazy stuff going up everywhere. And there, except there was one strip of grass. Everything else was just shrub and I would say weed, but exotic plants or whatever it was. But there's this strip of grass. I thought, I'm mowing my lawn. I'm going to mow their lawn. So I just kind of go down, zip, zip, come back. And uh, a couple hours later, I'm outside. They come walking out. I'm like, I I better want to shake my hand or something. And so reach out my hand. They go, you mowed one of my plants. And I go, well, what do you mean? She goes, there was something growing up over here that uh, I wanted to kind of see what developed and what it was. Like, until the city flagged you with an ordinance violation? Like, I don't, I don't understand. And, and so anyway, like, my best efforts with this person never seemed to connect. And the way we bonded was over a mariachi band. <laughs> True story. Their house, we called it the, no, I'm not, not going to give too many details. Um, their house, you could actually get up on the top of it, and there was a courtyard, and they were going to have a party for some of their coworkers. And they came and told me, hey, we're going to have a mariachi band up on the roof. So hopefully it doesn't disturb you. And I thought, hey, absolutely. That sounds fun. As a matter of fact, can we have some people in our yard that night to enjoy it? Yeah, that sounds great. Mariachi bands brings the world together. And, and then I said, one of them, it's their birthday. Could you play happy birthday? Have the mariachi band like turn over and play happy birthday? Absolutely. And from that point on, It was still really difficult with my neighbor, but we always had the mariachi band where we connected. And over the years, I've had different neighbors, and some were good and some were challenging. My neighbor, when I lived in Frisco, Ryan across the street, he was a great neighbor. Right now, I've got several neighbors. Man, I've got three great neighbors right now, but I've got some neighbors that I just don't know. And so when I ask you what comes to mind when we say the word neighbor, I don't know if it was stories or specific faces, but when Jesus was asked what was most important in terms of honoring God and living out his commandments, neighbor came to mind for him. In Matthew 22, Jesus said this. It's in several of the different gospels. It's in there. But in Matthew 22, it says, one of them, them, meaning a teacher of the law, an expert in the law, tested him with a question. They're trying to test Jesus, pop quiz Jesus. With a pop quiz with Jesus, he always knows it's coming, right? So it's like he can study ahead of time. But anyway, nice try. Teacher, what is the greatest commandment in the law? At the time, there were over 600 laws. Some we find in the Bible. Some were just added on. They loved creating laws. And then they loved debating about what's the greatest and what's it look like to keep it right. And they got so focused on the law that they they were so heavenly minded, they were no earthly good at times. He said, what's the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And then I'm sure at that point, the guy wanted to push back because this is what they did. They would argue, counterpoint, or what about this? Somebody else, then he, Jesus stopped him. And he said, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. 
And he quotes first, first Deuteronomy 6, 5, and then Leviticus 19, 18. And he puts these two together. And then he makes this statement. Everything else, everything else hangs on these two commands. Or to say it another way, if you do these two, you do them all. You get it right. And he essentially boils it down to love God with all and love all. That's it. Love God, love people. Love God with everything you have and love your neighbor. And everything else hangs on these two. And if you were to just, for instance, take the Ten Commandments, loving God and loving people, boy, they're all in there. If you do that, you're probably not going to kill someone because that wouldn't be loving people. You're, if you're going to honor the Sabbath and keep it holy, well, you're kind of honoring God. Like it all kind of fits in there. And one of the things I think that Jesus points out by kind of offering this up is he says, you can do this. But at the same time, I think he puts it out there, you can't do this. This is hard to do. But it really is kind of very simple. And one of the things I've learned is if I learn that God really does love me with everything he has, it makes it easier for me to love him and love others. And then if I really want to love God, loving my neighbor means I'm loving one of his kids. It really does keep it very simple. But at the same time, it pushes us to the limits of saying, God, without your help, this is going to be hard. But Jesus does us a great service by saying to this guy and to us, it's very simple. Love God with all and love your neighbor as, your strength, I mean, as yourself. Everything else hangs on these two. And most of us know that. But most, many of us have become numb to the great commandment. What if Jesus meant we should actually love our neighbors? And what if he meant we should actually love our actual neighbors? The person that comes to mind with the mariachi band. The person that comes to mind that they keep doing that thing over and over again that you kind of keep trying to politely suggest, hey, could you stop that? What if it means loving the person that you don't know? You refer to them as, hey, buddy, how's it going, pal? Good to see a friend. The power and genius of the great commandment is that it's so simple, but incredibly powerful when we act on it. And Jesus does this, I don't think just to give us boundary lines and a playing field, but to say, this is how you work best. And this is how the world works best. The smartest thing we could do to collectively, all of us together, impact our world would just be to do that. To actually love God with everything and love our neighbor the same way we would want to be loved by others. It's so, it could be so impactful, not just on the world. It could be life-changing. But what I really believe is if you live this way, it impacts you first. It impacts your faith. Do your neighbors come to mind when you think about your faith? If you wake up today and say, today I want to love God with all I have, do you instinctually think, who can I express that to that lives around me? Do your neighbors come to mind when you think about what it looks like to honor God, to love God, and to have a faith that's thriving. I really do believe it impacts your faith when you live this out. And the thing is, and the thing I've, I've known for a while, and I was, I've experienced this to be true, whenever we break a commandment, God tells us to follow that because it ends up breaking us. But when we honor this, it's when we truly experience what life is meant to be lived like. So how do you think you're doing at living that out in your life? How are you doing at taking the great commandment literally? Let me give you a pop quiz as well. In your program, there's an insert that looks a lot like this. As a matter of fact, it looks exactly like this because we have a Xerox machine that copies it. And so you've got this. If you don't have this, you can take a program, turn it over, and draw a tic-tac-toe board with nine squares. You could uh, actually uh, get one of those before you leave today. I want to encourage you to do this. It'll be, let me just meddle for a minute. It'll be awkward and uncomfortable and difficult for some of you. Some of you, you might do really good at this. What you're going to do, do you have it with you? Do you have it out? You're lying in a church to a pastor. How could you do that? Just kidding. 
Okay, in the center square, center square, blue square, write your address. Or just write me. Uh, that's fine. You can do that if you think someone's going to look next to you and make plans to come by and ask for some, a cup of sugar or something. But just write your name. And then those, those squares around it, here's what I want you to do. If the middle box is you, what are the eight houses or apartments or dorm rooms or people, whatever it is, campers, whatever it is, what are the eight closest households or individuals that are closest to you? You probably don't live in a community that's mapped out like a grid like this. As a matter of fact, in my neighborhood, I, know, I have a hard time knowing my neighbors on the other side of the alley. We, we have front garage and we go out to the dumpster, uh, but for whatever reason, it's still in my mind, I think someone's out there to get me when I take the trash out at night, so I go in real fast and real, real quick. I still think that some ninjas are lurking, to, ready to ambush me. I watch too many James Bond movies, I guess, and so I'm always on high alert out there. I do know one of my neighbors behind us, and they're a great neighbor. But, but it might not be the eight perfectly laid out, but the eight closest one to you that you have access to, that you would see the most. And in the box representing those, each one of those, I want you to write an A, a B, and a C. And the first thing I want you to do before you write the A, B, and C, I already did it, somewhere in that box, what are the names of the people that live there under A? What are the names? If you just know first names, that's fine. If you know first and last, that's even better. Of everybody in that house that you know. There's eight names. And please don't write buddy, pal, friend, or, you know, don't do that. If you don't know, just write a question mark. Like, for instance, our neighbors immediately uh, to one side, I know their son's name, but I cannot remember their name. And it's been so long, it will be awkward for me to ask. But I'm going to. And for an introvert, that's really hard, but I'm going to do that. So go down, and then that's A, write the names. On B, what are some, what's some relevant information about each person? Some data or facts that you couldn't see just by standing there and looking at their house. For instance, their house is brown, does not count. He's an accountant, does. If you know where their kids go to school, if you know what grade they're in, if you know what, anything about their basic facts, Things that you might only know if you've actually spoken to that person once or twice. So names, some basic information, and then on C, write down this. Write down what are some in-depth things where on a first or second meeting, unless they are just a complete open book, they might not tell that to you, but things about their hopes in life, their fears in life, their struggles in life, their plans, their future plans. Anything that has to do with purpose in their lives that didn't become acquired through Facebook stalking, but through actual human interaction. Okay? How are you doing? Not good? Hey, I'll show you mine. I've got, this is mine. You can't really read the writing. Actually, if you're up close, you couldn't read the writing either. Like, I actually had somebody the other day look at my writing and go, are you writing in English? And I know, it looks like Klingon, but I promise it's English. So this is my house. Right over there are Gary and Andy. They're, uh, he and his wife, man, they're great people. Great people. Actually sponsored uh, uh, one of my kids in the readathon at school, just on their own. Just great, great people. I really like them. Great neighbors. Always ask how we're doing. Ask questions. Notices things. Great neighbor. Uh, and then to the other side is Miss Peggy. She's a great neighbor. She's a great neighbor. You know, we talk about so much about it's important to love your neighbor. I have some neighbors that I actually really do love. Like, I love being their neighbor. The other night, Miss Peggy came and knocked on our door, and it was late. I think we were watching Waco, that miniseries about, uh, anyway, if you're watching that, you know what that is. And so we're kind of all into that, and there's about to be this high-impact incident. All of a sudden, I was like, oh, the ATF's here. Look out. What's happening? I'm totally immersed in the thing. And, and it was actually Miss Peggy, and she just came to tell us, hey, there's a light on in your car. Uh, you might want to turn that off because the next day, probably our battery would be dead. 
And we already had that issue once. And I was like, man, thank you so much. She's a great neighbor. She lets my, my kids come over and hang out on the front porch. She's, she's a great neighbor. And her and her husband, they're good people. Man, they're great neighbors. Behind us are the Marshalls. John was playing guitar over here today. Uh, Amy, his wife, she's leading a small group there in Treehouse Club. Jackson helps make coffee. And almost every Sunday, your coffee is made by a middle schooler, Jackson. Jackson, are you in here? He's not in here. He's out there, probably making coffee. Sharp guy, sharp guy, young guy. Great. Love that. They're great neighbors. They live behind us, and I knew them here, here first. And then when we moved into our house, I found out they were my neighbors. And he's a great neighbor. He's fixed so many things for me. They're great neighbors. After that, I got a lot of blank space. A lot of blank space. I know that one's name of their kid. I know the two houses down, I know their daughter's name. Can't remember their name. I'm not doing so good on this. According to the, ex, uh, the experiences of, of the authors of The Art of Neighboring, uh, Jay Pathak and Dave Runyon, after leading this exercises with thousands of people, the results are very consistent, whichever group they get into. About 10% of the people can fill out the names of all eight of their neighbors on line A. Anybody do that? I'm not surprised by that. <laughs> Marita, great, great neighbor, I bet. Anybody else? Yeah, a few. It's tough, 10%. Not surprised by that one either. Good job. About 3% can fill out line B for every home. For every, uh, uh, every home. They know kind of what people do and where they go to school. They know some basic facts beyond what you can normally observe. Less than 1% can fill out line C, hopes, dreams, fears, and life purpose type stuff for every eight, home around, eight, eight homes around them. Anybody get a perfect score on that? Not even you? Close? Not even you? Sort of? No? Yeah. But man, you guys do it better than me. The, the reason I think this is important, and we're going to refer to this throughout the series, you can actually download this off the Live Oak app under the Naming Resources. If we don't know our actual neighbors' names, can we really say that we're loving our neighbors? Do you think when Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself, he meant just kind of a drive-by, did you watch the Super Bowl? I know, right? We'll see you. If we don't know our neighbors, how can we love our neighbors? So the question that we're trying to clarify is, who actually are our neighbors? Who does this mean that we need to love? Actually, one time when Jesus is having a conversation about the great commandment, Twice in the Gospels, it tells us that somebody came up and said, hey, what's the greatest commandment? Kind of testing him. And he answered with, with Deuteronomy 6 and Leviticus about love God with your heart, soul, and mind and love your neighbors yourself. Twice he answered it. But then there was another time, it tells us in Luke chapter 10, that Jesus is asked by somebody, what do I need to do to inherit eternal life? And he said, well, how do you read the, the law? How do you read the scripture? And that guy answered him the same way Jesus answered others. You love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and you love your neighbor as yourself. He gave the same answer. He agreed that with kind of what Jesus had said. And then it says this in Luke 10, verse 29. But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? And I don't think he was saying, Jesus, would you fill this out for me and tell me what are their names, what do they do, and what are their hopes and dreams? Would you do that for me? He wasn't saying that. He was trying to figure out who actually is my neighbor. Like, is it the guy that lives next door? Who is it? And how many next doors do I have to love? So Jesus tells him this story. When Jesus wanted to really help make a point, a lot of times he didn't just make a point. He told a story. It had emotion like a father and a son that ran away, that lost everything, and the son's coming back home to the father. Or a sheep being lost a coin being lost. He, tells, he told stories. And he tells a story here and says this, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and, you know, it wasn't exactly like he was cruising along in his Kia Sorrento and 
stopped at the Bucky's and, you know, pulled over for a big gulp. And I, I don't sell big gulps at Bucky's. Please don't write me an email about that. But you get the idea. This was not, not your average road trip. It was difficult. And it's actually, there's a spot that was fairly treacherous, <laughs> very treacherous, and had to be careful. And so, sure enough, he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and he went away. And, and, and they went away, leaving him half dead. Not all dead, just half dead. Well, Prince's Bride reference there. Uh, a, pre, a priest happened to be coming down the same road, and when he saw the man laying half dead, he passed by on the other side. So too a Levite, also a religious leader, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. The, the, if Jesus is writing a screenplay and he cast indifferent person number one and indifferent person number two, he cast them as religious leaders because in that day, if a religious leader did it, people thought, well, that must be how it must be done. So I think he's trying to put a little heat on them for saying, what kind of example are you setting? And the person that gets it right is not another religious leader. It's a Samaritan. And we've come to know it as the parable of the good Samaritan, which actually, in, even in the in, in everyday world, people don't know the Bible. Sometimes they know the term good Samaritan. It means someone who's a good neighbor, a caring person who notices a need and meets it. And for us, the idea of Samaritans kind of lost on us. But what had happened is over the years, Israel had been conquered and they had been taken away and lived in an exile and other people came in and Israelites were taken away. And over the years, there were a lot of people that had kind of lost their national identity and their spiritual identity. And Samaritans were people who kind of were a mixture of different breeds and a mixture of different faiths. And they, they were really looked down by people like this, the guy who was asking the question. They were not stars of shows. They were not stars of the stories. But Jesus makes this person the star. And he says this, But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was. And when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wound, pour, bandaged his wound pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day, so he's got time invested here. The next day, he took out two denarii, that's two days wages, money invested. And he gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Then it says this. He turns to the guy and says, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? And when you hear the story, it's obvious. It's a surprising casting choice, but it's obvious. The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. So Jesus told him, go and do likewise. He says, what that guy did, do that. And when Jesus tells this story, he takes the idea of the, great, uh, the good Samaritan and the great commandment, and he pushes it beyond just our normal block map. It's now your neighbor is anyone who crosses your path. Your neighbor is anyone who puts themselves on your radar or at least should because you are some way aware of their needs. What if we said yes to this? What if we said yes to being these kind of people in the world? What if we went and did likewise? There's several things I want you to see about this passage, if you go back and look at the phrasing the guy used with Jesus at the very beginning, he says this, he wanted to justify himself. He's not asking for a question of clarification. Hey, Jesus, I don't want to miss any of my neighbors. I don't want anyone to be left off my radar. Please tell me so I can make sure I can be a good neighbor to everyone. Instead, he's like, can you justify myself by saying, who do I have permission not to love? Who, who can I walk past and it be okay with you? Who is okay to overlook? Who do I not have to love? And he tries to define his neighbor as someone that he can choose to care for. But the Samaritan, he didn't choose to care for him. He just knew he needed to care for him because this is a person in need that's along his path. He met the physical, material, financial, and emotional needs of a man in his path. Our neighbors are in our path every day. 
And chances are, if we saw a fire truck pull up in front of their house, we would rally and say, what do you need? If we knew they were robbed, we would probably come up and say, how can I help? If we knew that someone important to them passed away and they were grieving, we would say, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry for your loss. Is there anything I can do? But for most of us, the battles we're fighting every day, they're not that obvious, are they? A fire truck doesn't pull up in our house when we are in emotional crisis, when we experience loss or pain or suffering, when we have hopes for a future that seems to be crumbling. We, that, that's not as obvious unless you know somebody, unless someone feels safe enough that you can open up and say, I'm really struggling right now. And I don't know how I'm going to get through the next day. I really need your help. We only open up to people that we trust, that are friends. And really it should be people that are neighbors that love us. Our neighbors are on our path on a daily basis and they have needs and they are people that matter to God. So what I would say is get off your donkey and do something. Do what he did. Interrupt your day. Change your plans. See the need that can't be seen just by looking, that can only be known by truly knowing someone. Now, the parable of the Good Samaritan shows us that the actual definition of neighbor is a lot bigger than just our literal neighbors. According to this parable, it's what we talked about in our Monday Matters series back in August. Where you show up on Mondays, it matters. Your coworker, classmates, people on your team. Everybody, whoever you're around on a regular basis, that includes your, they're included as well. Someone that you see as you're going from point A to point B that you don't really just spend a Monday at, but you happen to drive past them, that person is a need. They're a neighbor that has a need. When you go across the world to serve on a short-term mission trip or to go meet a need of another culture, they're your neighbors. When you give financially to help a kid experience food and education and health in a third world country, that's your neighbor. That is 100% true. However, that doesn't mean participating in those things excludes you or exempt you from the lesson that Jesus would say is, we need to love our literal, actual neighbors. They're still our neighbors. And great things can happen when we build relationship with the people that we live next to every day. The problem is in our culture, we have moved to be a backyard society. We park in our garage, we shut the door, we go in, we're out in the backyard with the fence around it. And when I grew up, it was a chain link fence. Now it's pickets and now you can average you pickets between the pickets so no one can even see in through the cracks. Complete isolation. What if your neighbors are losing by living so isolated, by you living so isolated? What if your faith is losing by you living so isolated? Great things happen when we build relationships with those who live closest to us and then work out from there. If we try to love everyone, we end up loving no one. Pick your eight, the ones that are closest, and start loving them. If we just say, I'm going to love kind of the random person here or there, it becomes a metaphorical, metaphorical love for a metaphorical neighbor, and the end result is that we actually do very, very little. And for me, I'm pretty simple-minded, so one of my words this year is just simplify. I'm in pretty good company. Albert Einstein said that everything should be made as simple as possible, but no more simple. At some point, something swims, uh, swings from being overly complicated to being overly simple. But somewhere in the middle is this idea of simplicity that brings focus. Focus is your friend. What if we focused in on what Jesus said is most important? Love your neighbor as yourself. It really does, I think, start with loving God with all you have. Because when you recognize how much God deserves our love and our worship and our attention... We owe everything to him. And when we understand how much he loves us, that he's given everything for us and he's given himself for us, 
we actually have this thing to draw from, this example to draw from of what it looks like to love others. But more than that, when you give your life to him, he gives his life to you and he says, let me love others through you the way I would love them. I want to do it through you, not just for you. Suddenly, our love can go to a whole nother level that's not, just not dependent on how much love we can muster. And love is not just an emotion. It is an action. It is a choice. And it is a commandment. And Jesus said, all the other commands hang on these two. It matters. And if we can only do a few things really well, let's make sure that at least one of them is the thing that Jesus said mattered most. Let's love our neighbor the way we would want to be loved and the way God loves them. Let's do that. And for us as a church, we believe this is a very strategic choice we've got to make as a church. We want Live Oak to be great neighbors to the people who live behind us. We want to be a great neighbor to Cooper West just down the street. It's the closest school to us. We want to be a good neighbor in our community of where we are right here. But we also want us individually as Live Oakers to be great neighbors where we live. Not for the purpose of saying, hey, and by the way, would you like to come to church with me? This is not a church growth program. It's not a program at all. A good neighbor, a relationship always trumps a good program. Relationships is what matters. And for, as, as live oakers, we're going to talk about this for three weeks and the series will end, but we will keep talking about this because we believe Jesus meant it when he said, love me with all and love all. And love your neighbor. Let it start where you live. A good neighbor is who Jesus called us to be. And the question every Christ follower needs to ask is, would my neighbors care if I left? I mean, some of us, they would care because, man, we barbecue, cook out really well. Man, I'd miss their smoker. <laughs> or I'd miss their hospitality. They bring great stuff to a party when they, when they come. Or they're actually pretty quiet neighbors. I like that. I'm scared for who's coming next. But what if they said, man, I felt so loved by my neighbors. I'm sad for our neighborhood that they're not here anymore. Someone call this just being incarnational or being the church where you live. Because for many people, if they're going to go to a church, or even if they don't, the message of the church, the sermon of the church, starts in the driveway. When they see someone who's a Christ follower, and they experience something from them. Let them experience love. So who are your actual neighbors, your literal neighbors? Who are your eight? And what I want to challenge you to do is take this block map, fill it out, keep it, and you start filling it in. Over the next three weeks, see if we can't get in the upper 10%. Some of you, we don't have GPAs anymore. We're out of school. But we liked those good grades when we got them. Hey, here's your chance. You can be the upper 10%. There's no stars in your chart. There's no report card. But It matters. Learn, retain, and use the names of your eight closest neighbors and love them well. And here's why I think it's so important. In Acts 17, Jesus, uh, Paul, Apostle Paul wrote this. From one man he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out and appointed their times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God decided you're going to live in this time. And he decided you're going to live in this place. You thought it was a floor plan. You thought it was a school system. You thought it was a job that kind of moved you there. No, God has placed you where you are. He appointed it. And he said, that place needs you. They need you. Because when you love your neighbor well, this happens. God did this so they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from any one of us. One of the reasons he's not far from any one of us is if you're a Christ follower, Christ is in you. And when you moved in your neighborhood, Jesus moved in the neighborhood. And he shows up when you love your neighbor. It's powerfully simple, but powerfully impactful that we should love our neighbors. There's some series resources for you that can help you through this. You can go to the Live Oak app or live-oak.org slash neighboring. And one of the things we're gonna do in there are some neighboring tips. You can sign up and get an email that will prompt you with some neighboring tips. We'd love to, for you to add yours. For instance, one of the tips that, I, don't, I can't remember if it's on there or not, but I know one thing I'm doing, we're actually moving two of our chairs in the back, backyard, up to the front and spend more front porch time than back porch time. And if we see someone we don't know, we're going to introduce ourselves. Not because we're suspicious, 
but they might be. <laughs> but simply because I want to know my neighbors so I can love my neighbors. So you can do that there. And then one of the things I want to do every week is give you a prayer. God, this is the prayer of the week. Just start with this prayer. God, give me a desire to know and care about my literal neighbors. And then this becomes your prayer list. God, give me a heart and a desire to know them and care about these people. Gary and Andy, Stephen, the Marshalls, Peggy, Amelia, and all the rest of the names I'm going to fill in. Let's stand for closing prayer. Jesus made it real simple, but it's hard. Love God with all and love all. Start with your neighbor and love them the way you want to be loved and the way that you experience love from your creator and your redeemer. Heavenly Father, I pray that, that we would be good neighbors. Not because it, it, turn, it, it earns us attention or affection from you. We have that already. But that's where our faith is, grows and where the faith of others is impacted. How different would our world be? What if we actually just, if we follow Jesus, we just assumed he meant it. It wasn't a suggestion. It was a commandment. And he made this commandment to love God and love others. Not because the world needed it. It does, and he knows that. But because we need that. God, for some of us, this is, this is a fight. Help us to fight for our neighbors instead of fighting with our neighbors. Help us to know our neighbors and love our neighbors with the kind of love that can only be experienced from you. It's in Jesus' name I pray, amen.